Okay, so now um, there was a question raised about sanctifying Sunday. And many people ask this because we're in a situation where you don't have mass. You can't you can't go to the can't go to the new mass, and she agrees. You can't go to the these compromised masses, and and I'll cover some of this with Archbishop Lefebvre, which we're going to basically review. So what do we do? It's a Sunday, no mass. Get the kids to dress up for Sunday mass. Not in pajamas. Sunday Mass set a time. We're going to have Holy Hour here. Or some, some of our missions, they all just get together at a house. And they take turns. Or they have a, some places have a chapel with the Blessed Sacrament. But whatever it is with the family or with others, have the children dress up, suit and tie and all that for Mass. Best Sunday clothes. So that at least they keep the, that good habit. And then, and then the, the law of the church is when you cannot get to Mass, and in the old code of canon law, if Mass was over an hour away, this is horse and buggy days, if Mass was over an hour away, you weren't obliged to go. So you see the mind of the church in her laws. So obviously that's horse and buggy with, you know, rain and muddy roads and Going an hour, it's a long, it's a big deal. Rounding up the horses. and So now with our air-conditioned cars, to travel two, three, four hours isn't much. And in the United States, we have some very generous families over all these years, as long as I've been a priest. I remember one family driving four hours one way to Mass, four hours back home with a van full of kids. One family will drive... Uh, from Nevada to Idaho, 13 to 12 hours, one way for Mass, for the resistance Masses. So, so, so obviously the, church, the mind of the church is an hour far away, you're not obliged to go, but that's horse and buggy, 1917 era. Now we got the air-conditioned cars, and so God wants of us to make extra sacrifices, obviously. So when you don't have Mass, what do you do? Set the time, get dressed for, as if you were going to Mass. Start either with the rosary and uh, read the Missal out loud. Someone can read out loud the Missal, usually the Father. Go through the Missal. And then um, some will read out loud a sermon of St. Alphonsus or St. John Vianney or Archbishop Lefebvre. Or record, tape or, uh, you know, go on internet and play one of the sermons of the resistance priests. Or old sermons of, um, like, Father Gomer de Pau. Father Gomer de Pau was one of those heroes in the United States. Uh, one of those great independent priests who resisted right from the beginning. 67, he was already opposing Vatican II. 1967. And that's before... Archbishop Lefebvre even got started with the seminary. So Father Gomer de Pau, if you hear some of his talks, they're very good. Father Gomer, G-O-M-E-R, de Pau, D-E-P-A-U-W. And he's a feisty old priest, and, and uh, he's already opposing the conciliar church. Um, who else? Uh, Archbishop Sheen, of course, has some very good sermons. His are now available. So listen to a sermon. There are many out there, good talks. And then what's obliging is to sanctify the Sunday about an hour, about as much time as you would spend at a Sunday Mass. So high Mass is an hour and a half to two hours. Low Mass, about an hour. So remember, though, um, it's easy it's easy to get lax. Well, there's no Mass Sunday after Sunday after Sunday. You get a little lax. There's no priest. And it can easily descend. So you want to keep it... God wants of us a little more generosity, a little more self-sacrifice in this time. And, and that's partly why the church is being punished in society, because of Catholics just become lax. 
they lose the focus on our Lord and they just become more entangled in the worldly interests. And our Lord is not pleased with that. He's not pleased with that. He wants us to love him really above all things. So so about so uh, rosary, read the mass. Some some places say another rosary between reading the mass and uh, hearing the sermon. Then hear the sermon or read and then another rosary. So they get three rosaries, sermon and reading of the mass on Sunday. Pretty much what they do. And then after that, they have a big banquet together, coffee and donuts and talk, and, and the kids play together and, you know, make it kind of a day out of it. That's what many families do. Uh, one group in Quebec, they were reading out loud the encyclicals of the popes, uh, reading out loud the archbishop's uh, writings. So, so that's an idea for Sundays, sanctifying the day. So what is required by church law? Don't work, manual work, but um, you, uh, you sanctify the day as you would at Mass. Spend as much time as you would at Mass in prayer, reading the Mass, hearing the sermon. Okay, in this brief conference, I don't intend to go long, but I do intend to just remind you and myself of the great mind of, I, I consider Archbishop Lefebvre a great gift for our time. I'm convinced he's the one the Virgin Mary of Quito spoke about when she said at the end of the 20th century, so she gives a precise time, at the end of the 20th century there will be, raise up a prelate basically who will save the faith and the priesthood and revive the apostolic zeal of the priests like the apostles. And we know with Archbishop Lefebvre, as he, as he says, when he was in Dakar in Africa, he just, inspired by the Holy Ghost, he just felt this longing desire to form priests for the church. And we know that good bishops, that's their first concern, is, is children for the church, priests for the church, priests to offer the sacrifice, form priests for tomorrow. That should be primary in any bishop's mind. We see great examples like St. Rafael Guizar in, in Mexico. He's, his body is incorrupt in Veracruz. Um, Father Rafael was from his stock. And he, he told his seminarians, I will always have my eye on you from heaven. And when they unburied his body, they found his body perfectly incorrupt and one eye open. So they all remembered he would keep his eye on them from heaven. But this good bishop, he, he was a great bishop. I wish we had some like him. He would anoint the dying on the battlefield after the war, the Cristero battles. And one Freemasonic soldier came up to him, a straggler, and said, hey, are, are you Bishop Ra Raphael? And he had his weapon in hand. He was probably going to kill him. And rather... Raphael looked to the left and right and punched him so hard in the face that he was knocked out cold. He took his rifle, threw it, finished anointing the dying, and went on. But he kept the seminary open right across from the city hall. And the, the newspaper put out one day a, a picture of Bishop Raphael Gitzar, wanted, dead or alive, Bishop Raphael Gietzer, because they, they, they hated him, the Freemasons. So he walked right to the city hall, walked right into the room and office of the mayor of the town, who was behind that newspaper article, a Mason, of course, threw the newspaper down on the desk and said, here I am, what do you want? <laughs> and so the mayor started shaking and... Um, and he said, oh, no, nothing, nothing. You can go, nothing. There's, there's nothing important. So anyway, good bishops like that, we, the church needs. So the main, the goal of Archbishop Lefebvre was to give the church, fight modernism, fight for the kingship of Christ, fight Vatican II and, and its errors, and give the church good priests. This was his heart and goal. 
And he did say later in life, had I, had I could do it again, I would focus more on the counter-revolution in forming the priests. And maybe, maybe, maybe that's why so many priests did slide with the 2012 Vatican II eruption in the society because maybe they were not so formed in the counter-revolution. In the seminary in the United States, I can say we were very fortunate to have Bishop Williamson at the time because he was very, very counter-revolutionary, very rooted in St. Pius X, the good encyclicals, and he taught us the acts of the magisterium. And if some people say he, he held these ideas on the new mass even before, a long time ago, but if he did, I, I never knew it, but some of the priests heard it. But if he did, he was, he was a member of the SSPX. So Archbishop Lefebvre, his position was wings over the whole SSPX. So all the priests and all the bishops, because the leader, the superior, forms the inferiors, the superior's position was very clear. Don't go to the mass. It's poisonous. It's dangerous to your faith. Stay away from it. So now, since Bishop Williamson was expelled, and he, if, and he still holds those ideas, or just started them, I don't know, now it's in the limelight. And now his, his, his teachings on the new Mass clearly go against Archbishop Lefebvre. So let's pray for him to just get back on the horse and keep fighting the way he was meant to be. All the four bishops plus the three more. So do pray for them. It would be wonderful if we just had one of them stand up and just hold the line of the archbishop. So what's the line of the archbishop? Let's cover a few points. I'm just going to scan through a number of his quotes. And I'm a, I know this might be boring. This might be just reading out papers. But I don't care. We need to be reminded all of us, and maybe that's partly why we've seen some resistance priests fall, fall to the left, fall to the right, or just make big mistakes. You know, good father, good priests who have fallen to set of ecantism, and other priests who have fallen, say, you know, where we're going with Rome, well, let's go. One priest in France left the priory with his shorts on and his suitcase, we're going to Rome, let's go. So, and then uh, the most recent event in, in Kentucky, I didn't expect it, because Father Pfeiffer is not going to Novosordo. He's not going soft on the new mass. He's not going to set up a contest. And that's good, thank God. But there was a, a big mistake made, of course, with this dubious bishop, who has a dubious priesthood in, in episcopacy with... You know, is it valid or is it not? Some show it is. Some event evidence show it's questionable. Um, I don't want to get into it here because it's just, in my opinion, a waste of time to prove that. But I've seen the ten fake pictures. I've seen the fudge documents that look tampered with. And I've talked to the uh, some of the restaurants that had the cases of fraud. And these are public record so it's obvious when you got cases of fraud, especially that's deception, that's lying, that's cheating, such a character you just don't even deal with at, at a level of episcopacy and ordinations and consecrations. You just stay away. St. Paul says, let the bishop be without blemish. And, uh, you know, but some will say, well, look at St. Augustine. He was a big sinner, but St. Augustine converted and he never went back to his sins. But, but uh, fraud is a, is a particular sin that tells you a lot about the character. So anyway, that was a huge mistake. And I thought it was over in, in, in uh, 2015 when we disassociated. Because we were hoping, I was hoping that maybe this is the bishop God sends us to continue and ordain our seminarians. But as things came more to light, thanks to many good souls praying to Our Lady to help us, guide us in this, then enough came to light to say, stay away. 
So even Greg Taylor in England was telling Father last summer, Father, I think we got enough evidence to tell us we just got to drop this once and for all. But it wasn't dropped and it was aggressively pushed up until January of this year. So that's when I had to make my decision in the last minute. You know, I, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not telling an untruth. I'm not telling any exaggeration. I had to plead with Father, you know, just put the word disassociation in your statement of disassociation. So it was a big struggle just to put that word. So when I saw that he wasn't really convinced, I, I had to make my move, which was not easy because we do need a good seminary. So pray for that and pray. And behind that, we need a good bishop. So, so let's listen to Archbishop Lefebvre and keep our heads straight in all this, in this mess. But also let us live by the command of our Lord. A new commandment I give unto thee, that you love one another as I loved you. Catholics must love, really live the command of love more than anyone else. It's more binding on us than anyone else. So, you know, in the, we have the Amish in the United States. They're, 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 a, they're a sect of the Puritans called the Amish. And they still wear uh, the old clothes with no buttons and zippers. Well, they might have buttons, but no zippers. Some have zippers, some have buttons. Some, if they have zippers, they'll get excommunicated. Some will have, if they have rubber on their tires, they'll get excommunicated on their horse and chariot. So uh, they have all these fragmented groups. But they are a, 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 a founded by Father Simon Menno, hence the Mennonites. And the Amish um, in the United States, if they, one of their family members, their barn burns down, all of them pull together the men. They go buy wood, they all pitch in, and they build a new barn within a week. How come charity of heretics puts us Catholics to shame? It shouldn't. We should have a greater charity for each other and a greater love for each other that we would be willing to die even for our enemies, not just our friends. So that's really what should shine in us. And remember, we're all fighting. The Catholics in the United States, the Catholics in Europe, England, we're all one, one with Christ in the one Holy Catholic Apostolic Church, the Roman Catholic Church, we're fighting for her survival. And we're fighting under Our Lady. And at La Salette, the Virgin Mary said, it's time for you, you little ones, you little humble ones, it's time for you to rise up. And I think that's our hour now. For the little ones, the insignificant little ones, all of us little sheep of the church, it's time to rise up and fight for Our Lady with her weapons and hold the line of Archbishop Lefebvre, which is this. I'm going to touch on several topics. First, <clears throat> on the combat for Christ the King. Archbishop Lefebvre, taken from, they have uncrowned him, an excellent work. This century of apostasy, without doubt, in a different way from the centuries of the faith, the high Middle Ages, belongs to Jesus Christ. On the other hand, the apostasy of the great number manifests the heroic fidelity of the small number. It was like this at the time of the prophet Elias in Israel, when God preserved only 7,000 men who did not bend their knee before Baal. That's in 3 Kings chapter 19. Let us, therefore, not bend our knee before the cult of man, the expression of Paul VI, established in the sanctuary and sitting as if it were God. Let us remain Catholics, adorers of the only true God, our Lord Jesus Christ, with his Father and the Holy Ghost. So, Archbishop Lefebvre, if you remember, <clears throat> before he died... There was a group of Muslims who wanted to take him to court because he said, Europe is being invaded by Muslims and it's up to you French. You French people must keep your country Catholic. So they were going to bring him to court and drag him in and all this. But his prophecy is true. They are invading. 
And of course, Pope Francis is behind this, and George Soros is behind this, the big, high-up Judeo-Mason. They want to dissolve and destroy what's left of Christendom. That's why the burning of Notre Dame, I have no doubt, is, is uh, Muslim hands behind it, because they have a they have a whole list of desecrations before that. Over 100 churches have been desecrated. Archbishop Lefebvre said they're going to take your daughters and sell them, traffic them as slaves and things to be used. And that's what's happening. Sweden is having outbreaks of rape and looting. They don't know what to do. And there's prophecies that Paris will burn and France will walk in its ankles in blood. So when they declare jihad, it is a real war strategy. They're moving in, and it's not young old ladies with carriages and young late girls. It's strong men moving into Europe. And they're, they're in for war. And they're, but it's a punishment on Europe because they turn their back on the faith. And Archbishop Lefebvre used to say that. So... Um, Archbishop Lefebvre, when someone asks if we know when there will be an accord with Rome, my answer is simple. When Rome recrowns our Lord Jesus Christ, we cannot be in agreement with those who uncrown our Lord. The day when they recognize once again our Lord as King of all peoples and nations, and not Muhammad and not Hinduism and not Protestantism, when they recognize Rome, once again, our Lord as King of all peoples and nations, it will not be us with whom they have rejoined, but the Catholic Church in which we dwell. This is beautiful, because we're, we're not some fringe group. We are Roman Catholic. We stay with the tradition of the whole Catholic Church, the 20 councils. Who are the ones going off? Who are the ones going into schism and false uh, beliefs? It's those who follow Vatican II in the New Mass. Archbishop Lefebvre, Fidelity, number 70, 1993. This is a very important quote because many, even of the traditional Catholics today, are saying, well, I got the Latin Mass. What's the problem? We, our local parish now has the Latin Mass. Isn't that great? I don't have to travel now. I don't have to wait for Mass every so often. I got the local Mass. And Archbishop Lefebvre said, it's not about the Mass. It's about the faith. And if, if a priest says the Latin Mass, but he still follows Vatican II and accepts the new Mass, accepts, he, he's still fighting with the enemy. The point of opposition and the reason why there is no possibility of an agreement with modernist Rome is this. The question is not so much about the Mass, because the Mass is just one consequence of them wanting to get closer to Protestantism. And so they changed the worship, the Mass, sacraments, catechism, etc. The real fundamental opposition is against the reign of our Lord Jesus Christ. Apportet illum regnare. He must reign, says St. Paul. Our Lord came to reign. He must reign. R-E-I-G-N, reign. They, the modernists, say no, we say yes, with all its consequences. What are the consequences of the kingship of Christ? That's the close quote. What are the consequences the archbishop means? Well, he spoke about that too. He said in Africa, he saw with his own eyes, as these people converted and embraced the kingship of Christ, and even the mayor became Catholic. He saw the cities became cleaner. The, the children were, received the catechism. Many converts were happening. They would run the Catholic school, and a lot of Muslims wanted their kids to come to the Catholic school, but they couldn't let everybody in, but they would let a certain percentage in. And that influence of Catholicism on the non-Catholic kids converted their families. So many Muslims even converted, and Muslims are not easy to convert. So Archbishop Lefebvre saw, uh, you know, the orphanages, the hospitals, the, the convents, the seminaries, the priests, all this growing under him. And he saw the reign of Christ the King. And the laws in Africa, of course this was 1950s, 
They would never even dream about allowing abortion or euthanasia or divorce. Uh, so, so the consequence of the kingship of Christ is the real, true defense of the rights of the true rights of man. Because the false rights of man, the Declaration of Rights of Man, as Father Dennis Fahey points out, was written in 1793. It was condemned by Pope Pius VII. And this Declaration of the Rights of Man is the basis of the whole modern world's thinking. I have my rights. I can do what I want with my body. I can, do what I, I can believe whatever I want. It's my right. And that's false. I don't have the right to believe error. And I don't have the right, a woman does not have the right to kill her baby in her womb. But what do they say when they're walking in to have an abortion? And people try to stop them and say, look, adopt your baby. Don't kill the baby. And what do they say? I can do what I want with my body. It's my right. So... Pope Leo XIII says, we've heard enough about the rights of man. Let's hear for once about the rights of God. And what about the rights of that little baby that's being butchered in the mother's womb? What about the rights of the old people being killed off by euthanasia? You know, so this talk about human rights ends up destroying human rights, the true human rights. So only, we only have true human rights in the reign of Christ the King, because our Lord Jesus Christ loves the poor loves the handicapped, loves the crippled, loves the unfortunate. And now today, I think it's probably that way here also in the United States, a young couple comes, she's expecting a baby, they do, a, they do an ultrasound and they see, well, your baby looks like it's going to have Down syndrome. I suggest you terminate the pregnancy because he won't have a high quality of life. This is what they're doing. And... I know a young couple in New York, the doctor said just that, you might want to terminate your pregnancy because it looks like he might have some handicaps. And the father, who was a young uh, Syracuse University basketball player, he nearly put his fist right through his face. It, he told me, it took all my strength not to knock that bishop, or knock that uh, doctor flat on the ground. So that's what we're dealing with today. So... That Masonic Declaration of the Rights of Man is what's behind all this garbage. So we Catholics got to understand, forget the rights of man, which is what inspired the Declaration of Independence, Declaration of the Rights of Man our, in the United States, our, our amendment saying that Congress will make no laws regarding religion. That all stuff, forget all that. That's death to any nation. It's suicide of a nation. And poor Australia, they have a, in the airport, there was an advertisement called Man Cave College or something. And the, the advertisement says, in re, this is a reaction to the appalling number of suicides of young men in Australia. So I don't know what your rate is, but why are they committing suicide? And it's because our, we're, we're living in the, we have rejected Christ the King, so we're suffering the consequences, which is a suicidal nation given to death. Killing our babies, killing our old, killing the unwanted babies. It's really sick. So the only answer is, is the kingship of Christ. And Archbishop Lefebvre, thank God, thank the good God, he's, he's the one prelate who held high the banner of Christ the King. Because even in the United States, we had the great Bishop Sheen, and he was great, but he himself, in 1970s, fell to the new mass. He never lost the faith, and he always re resisted the errors, but he, he did end up going with Vatican II in the new mass, but he never preached the kingship of Christ, which is what Americans need to hear, especially, and, and here too. We've never had, in Australia or the United States, the social reign of Christ the King, but with it comes all the consequences of the kingship of Christ are babies are protected, marriage is defended, and the old are cared for. And since people have large families, because contraception goes against God's law, there's many, many children. And out of large families comes a good schooling and generosity, responsibility, charity, forgiveness, 
And that's the groundwork for good vocations, priests and nuns and monks. Archbishop of Fev, they have uncrowned him. Page 211. All those conciliar fathers who gave their vote to Dignitatis Humanae, the Declaration on the Rights on Religious Liberty, and proclaimed religious liberty with Paul VI, did they realize that they had in fact uncrowned our Lord, Jesus Christ, by tearing away the crown of his social royalty? Did they grasp that they were, had very concretely dethroned our Lord Jesus Christ from the throne of his divinity? That's Vatican II. What's wrong with Vatican II? They dethroned Jesus Christ the King. That's the problem. It's not Latin at Mass, although that's part of it. It's not the changing of the sacraments, although that's part of it. It's not their evolution garbage, although that's part of it. But at all, the pinnacle of their Vatican II was to dethrone Jesus Christ the King. Archbishop Lefebvre, did they understand that by making themselves the echo of the apostate nations, they were making those abominable blasphemies rise up, rise up towards his throne? We do not want him to rule over us. We have no king but Caesar. No, it's not only the mass, says Archbishop Lefebvre, which divides us, it's doctrine. That's clear. It is essential, Archbishop Lefebvre, for us to have the conviction of this truth of faith. Everything, including civil society, our White House, your parliament here, the parliament in England, all of Europe, Africa, Asia, including civil society, all has been devised to serve, directly or indirectly, the redeeming plan of our Lord Jesus Christ. Father Dennis Fay also says the state must help the church help people live in the state of grace. Isn't that beautiful? The state should help people live in the state of grace, which means you have to censor the printing press, censor the internet, censor the books, and censorship is good. Parents censor the food they, their children eat. If the kids had their way, they'd be eating sugar morning, night, and all day long with a gallon of ice cream for dessert. But the, you have to censor what they eat or they get sick. So the state has to censor these bad publications or bad immodesty or false beliefs spread in the propaganda. That's why the enemies of Christ, the Judeo-Masons, want to control the propaganda and the media, and in doing so, they brainwash the people. And Pius XI mentions this in his condemnation of communism, his encyclical Divini Redemptoris. He mentions the, uh, the communists and the enemies of Christ control the propaganda and the media, and they brainwash the people. Archbishop Lefebvre even warned against false shepherds. Garage bishops. Archbishop Lefebvre totally condemned their actions and warned, um, warned all Catholics to have nothing to do with so-called traditional priests who had themselves consecrated by shaky bishops. They will bring ruination and scandal on the church, Archbishop Lefebvre replied when asked his opinion on the scandal-ridden consecrations. It, Archbishop Lefebvre, it is a direct result of what happens when one loses faith in God and separates himself with Rome and the Holy Father. And the enemies of the church, including those who so strongly promote modernism, will try to associate us and other good traditional Catholics with these fanatics in hopes of trying to bring discredit upon the good as well as the evil. So he's talking about these garage bishops, our doubtful bishops, and that's why uh, in the case of Kentucky, he was being very pushed, too pushed, too much pushed, this, this dubious bishop. So, um, Father Byman, I'll give his quote here. Father Byman was <laughs> a great old priest. He was from Holland. He lived in the United States in California. And... I met him in Lourdes 
He was, driving, he was riding his bike out of the city as it was being bombed when he was a boy. And uh, Father Byman, a great old priest, faithful to tradition, like your heroes, the four great heroes that I only know of so far in Australia are <clears throat> Father Cummins. What's his first name? Augustine. Father Augustine Cummins. What a warrior. He kept the faith in the traditional mass, persecuted by the bishops, but he would write them. And he would try to wake, help open their eyes, but they just mocked him. And one modernist priest said to uh, one, some of the faithful in Streaky Bay, why are you going to follow that old priest? He's an old bag of bones. He'll be dead in a few weeks. And it turns out Father Cummins outlived that priest by 30 years. He was the one to die within a few, a year or two. So God bless Father Cummins and then Father Buckley. I w he was out in Brisbane area. And the bishop really tormented him, put him in a psych ward. And they zapped his brains. So overjolted him, he, he became a vegetable. And one of the faithful told me, I went to see him went 10 days before his death. And there he was on his bed, his hair untamed and long, dressed almost in rags. Father, father. And all he could do was mumble. That's like a martyrdom. I'm sure he'll have a high place in heaven. A martyr of the persecution of these bishops, modernist bishops. Another one is um, Father Patrick Fox. Father Kevin Robinson used to praise him. Father Kevin Robinson owed his vocation to him, an old warrior priest. And then Father Monsignor Hatsworth. Hatswell. Monsignor Hatswell. So don't forget these good priests. These are real heroes, especially you youngsters. These are real heroes of Australia. So Father Byman was like one of these in the United States. We traditionalists are already in trouble with dozens, if not hundreds, of false bishops and bastard priests, consecrated and ordained by schismatics. If we don't stop our apathy in so serious a case, the Catholic Church may be flooded in a short time by hundreds are thousands of vocationless imposters <laughs> consecrated and ordained arbitrarily are having bought their orders. Let all the good priests remain united in charity and mutual understanding and prayer, confident in our Lord, who promised, I shall be with you all days, even to the end of time. Message, stay away from dubious bishops, period. Archbishop Lefebvre on the new Mass. Um, there's tons of quotes. I'll just take a few. The Mass is poisoned, this new Mass. It is bad, and it leads to the loss of faith little by little. We are clearly obliged to reject it. Archbishop Lefebvre's sermon preached in 76 in Lille, August 29th. This union with liberal Catholics won't be which liberal Catholics want between the church and the revolution is an adulterous union, adulterous. This adulterous union can only beget bastards. Where are these bastards? They are the new rites. The new rite of mass is a bastard rite. The sacraments are bastard sacraments. We no longer know whether they are sacraments that give grace. We no longer know if this mass gives us the body and the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. The priests emerging from the seminaries are bastard priests. Bam! Any confusion, anybody? <laughs> In conscience, all we can do is turn priests and faithful away from using the Novus Ordo Mise if we wish that the complete and whole Catholic faith remains still alive. Archbishop Lefebvre, 1983. So, it's so clear. It is a lesson of faith and at the same time a source of our faith indispensable for us in this age when our faith is attacked from all sides. We have need of this true Mass, of this Mass of all time, of this sacrifice of our Lord Jesus Christ really to fill our souls with the Holy Ghost and with the strength of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now it is evident that the new rite, if I may say so, supposes another conception of the Catholic religion. It's another religion. 1976. Archbishop Lefebvre, 
1981. In my opinion, the Protestant reform, this mass of Thésé, Thésé is a big ecumenical center in France, is certainly evil because it no longer affirms truths. It is a poisoned mass, a poisoned mass because when no, one no longer affirms the truly Catholic truths of the mass, as the Protestants wanted, little by little, faith in these truths also disappears. This, I would say, is so obvious, so obvious in all the consequences. So there's a lot more, but it's very clear. It have nothing to do with the new Mass. Archbishop Lefebvre on the Indult Mass. So what about the local parish that has the motu proprio Mass? I myself also during these years, 1984, have not ceased asking for Ro of Rome, leave us this liberty. And so faced with the insistence of so many people and mine also, they finally decided to do something. Unfortunately, however, they have added to it incredible conditions. It's absolutely unimaginable after all this to be interrogating people on their opinion. Do you reject the new Mass? If you reject the new Mass, then you don't have the right to say the old one. To my mind, this decree is a typical example of the present mentality at Rome, the progressive mentality. This is a progressive decree. It is not a traditional decree where Rome would act out of consideration for the holiness of the Mass, for the holiness of the faith, sanctification of the faithful, for the apostolate and good of souls and the glory of God. No, it's not that. It's pure politics. Using the Mass, open brackets, imagine in, in the United States this happened, and the bishop said it. We're allowing the Latin Mass to lure the Catholics back into the conciliar church. Close brackets. They conducted a referendum, a poll, to see who were in agreement. Because there was a small group holding out, they decided to make a concession, granting the Latin Mass, but to also add some conditions. That is politics, the same kind they practice in democracies. It is not supernatural at all. Archbishop Lefebvre, availing ourselves of the indult is tantamount to putting ourselves into a state of contradiction. So the indult of 1984 is exactly the same as the motu proprio of, nine, two, of 2007. And Pope Benedict, it should have been condemned by Bishop Follet because the cover letter to the motu proprio said all priests who say the Latin Mass must accept the new Mass. Archbishop Lefebvre would have said, forget it, which he did with the Indult of 84. It's a contradiction because at the same time that Rome grants the Fraternity of St. Peter's, for example, our La Berue Monastery, and other groups authorizing to say the Mass of all time, they also require the young priest to sign a profession of faith in which the spirit of the council must be accepted. It is a contradiction. The spirit of the council is embodied in the new mass. How is it possible to desire to preserve the mass of all time while accepting the spirit that destroys this mass of all time? It is completely contradictory. And then Archbishop Lefebvre on the Second Vatican Council. There's a, well, this won't be anything new to you. But here's just a few summaries from Archbishop Lefebvre, of his own quotes. Some say the council was good and it has good, but only the reform is bad. But that is not true. Why? Because when Rome gave the reform, they also always say the reforms they do, they do them in the name of the council, always in the name of the council. It is evident that all reform came from the council. And if the reform is bad, it is impossible that the council be good and all reforms from it are bad. 1976. 1976, May 11th. This council gives the same rights to error as to truth. Jesus on an equal level as Barabbas. And on and on and on, uh, condemning Vatican II. So let that be clear. On the conciliar church, Archbishop Lefebvre, 
This council represents, in our view and in the view of the Roman authorities, a new church, which they call the Conciliar Church, 1976. The faithful have a right, a strict right, to know that the priests who serve them are not in communion with the counterfeit church, promoting evolution, Pentecostalism, or syncretism. 1988. It is not we who are in schism, but the conciliar church, 76. So, I think none of you have a problem with this. I should be very happy to be excommunicated from this conciliar church, said Archbishop Lefebvre. It is a church that I do not recognize. I belong to the Catholic Church. Interview, July 30th, 1976, uh, in the magazine called The Minute. That is no longer the Catholic Church. That is the conciliar church with all its unpleasant consequences, 1989. So on and on and on, many quotes condemning the conciliar church. And then on the modern orientation. <coughs> We cannot shake hands with modernists and keep following tradition. Not possible, not possible. May 11, 1976, this new faith, it is a new religion. It is a Protestant religion. That is a fact. How is it possible that the people give the authorization to this? How is it possible that the Pope give the authorization to this change? How is it possible that the Pope, Paul VI then, can sign this constitution on liturgical change, it is a deep mystery. So he goes on to say how it breaks with tradition. And here Archbishop Lefebvre, letter to friends and benefactors, we tremble at the thought that the infiltration of modernism, that is to say naturalism, may continue in the church. The consequences of this variable cancer are the most serious that the church has had to undergo during the course of her history. That is the corruption of the faith of numerous bishops and a great number of priests, monks, and nuns. These clerics reason like the modernists and the Protestants. Witness the newly published book, Bishop Speaks of the Faith of the Catholic Church. The ideas of sanctifying grace, original sin, mortal sin, and all its consequences the expiatory sacrifice of our Lord, which continues on our altars, all are spoiled. In their place, one finds all the errors of liberalism, of Americanism, of Sionism, and of modernism condemned by the sovereign pontiffs. Add to that the theology of liberation, Marxist theology, which is the Marxist interpretation of the gospel, a sacrilegious and outrageous misinterpretation of our Lord, Therefore, let us not be amazed that the patience of God is exhausted. And then other, uh, Rome cannot be trusted. So here Archbishop Lefebvre makes it clear we can't put ourselves under modernist Rome. And I even wrote to him, Dom Gerard, this is 1989, we must no longer discuss with the Roman authorities. They only want to bring us back to the council. We must not have relations with them. Dom Gerard replied that his case was different and that he would try anyway. I do not approve. And what Bishop Follet did in 2012, Archbishop Lefebvre would say, I do not approve because they're not professing the kingship of Christ. 1988, it is time that a second decision take, it is time to take a second decision to face up to this Rome what else can we do? And if they insist that it is worse this time around, because this time it would, it would mean excommunication, well, I reply that the basic problem remains unchanged. Rome means to exterminate tradition. And that has not stopped. It's steamrolling now. So all these are quotes showing don't go with Rome, don't, dis don't make dialogue, hold fast to tradition. And this is, there's tons of quotes here. And it's all consistent. All consistent. Archbishop Lefebvre in his book, Spiritual Journey, let us keep the faith above all else. It is for this that our Lord died, because he affirmed his divinity. It is for this that all the martyrs died. It is by this that all the elect are sanctified. Let us flee from those who make us lose the faith or diminish it.
flee. And then he says, we can't trust these people. Um, it is with a heavy heart that we have trouble with Rome. Those who understood the problem and have just, uh, and that we have just worked to continue straight and firm on tradition and faith feared the efforts I made to Rome. And he, he actually admits, for those who say, you know, why didn't you try to work out something with Rome? He says, at least I can say, I went farther than I should have, he says. Rome is an apostasy. We cannot have any confidence in them. They have lost the faith. Our Archbishop Lefebvre, uh, putting ourselves under modernist bishops, which they're doing more and more now. He says in 1975 in his letter to friends and benefactors, number nine, Every Catholic can and must resist anyone in the church who lays hands on the faith, the faith of the eternal church, upheld by his childhood catechism. The defense of his faith is the first duty of every Christian, more especially of every priest and bishop. Wherever an order carries with it the danger of corrupting faith and morals, disobedience becomes a grave duty. And then uh, the whole question on validity. Archbishop Lefebvre never, ever said all the new masses are valid, all the new ordinations and consecrations are valid. Nor did he say they're all absolutely invalid. But he did say they're all objectively doubtful. Archbishop Lefebvre, the conciliar church having now reached everywhere is spreading errors contrary to the Catholic faith and as a result of these errors, it has corrupted the sources of grace, which are the holy sacrifice of the Mass and the sacraments. It is all wasted because the holy sacrifice of the Mass, desecrated as it is, no longer confers grace and no longer transmits it. Anyone confused by that? Does the new Mass give grace? Open letter to confused Catholics, chapter 3, page 19. It is all wasted because the holy sacrifice of the Mass, desecrated it as it is in the new Mass, no longer confers grace and no longer transmits it. He calls it sterile, struck with sterility. All that is struck with sterility because we, we no longer have the true source of holiness, which is the holy sacrifice of the Mass. Profaned as it is, it, is, it no longer gives grace. It no longer makes grace pass. Archbishop Lefebvre, August 1972, priest retreat. Bishop Follet said uh, about six months ago that the Latin Mass is like drinking out of a gold cup. The new Mass is like drinking out of a tin cup. Archbishop Lefebvre said, no, it's not drinking anything but poison. Mass of all times, page 353, this new Mass is poisoned. It is bad, and it leads to the loss of faith little by little. We are clearly obliged to reject it. Archbishop Lefebvre on the oils, the, the, the quite doubtful sacraments of the new rite. If you read in your dictionary of theology about the sacrament of confirmation, the conclusion is that if, as was the case before Vatican II, if they do not use olive oil, then it is not a valid confirmation. But now in the new code of canon law, either olive oil or other oils may be used. Valid? Invalid? If they use the olive oil or peanut oil, it is invalid if it is not olive oil. Because in the Catechism of the Council of Trent, they say we must use olive oil, not any other oil, for validity. The situation is very difficult for us now. But I think after 10 or 20 years, it will be even worse, more difficult for you. Because the situation is getting progressively worse with time. They change. No right to give the sacrament. No rule. They're abandoning the, the, the rights. Now, for priestly ordinations, it is the same situation. Listen to this. Archbishop Lefebvre, 1983. We must see what they have done in each case. 
and to determine if the form was used, valid or not, we must do a study. In some cases, some theologians are against the validity, while some theologians are for validity. In the Anglican ordinations, you know that the church spent three and a half centuries studying the validity of the Anglican orders before finally giving a decision about the validity of Anglican ordinations, that is, that they are invalid. It is only after 350 years that we are finally sure that the Anglican ordinations are invalid. Laughingly, oh, it's very difficult to come to a decision on the new right in one week. If we think truly that a sacrament is most likely invalid, then we must redo the sacrament conditionally. That's why he did conditional confirmations. That's why Archbishop Lefebvre did conditional ordinations. Here's a quote from Bishop de Castro Mayer in his letter to Archbishop Lefebvre, 1970, January 29th. It seems to me preferable that scandal be given rather than a situation be maintained in which one slides into heresy. After considerable thought on the matter, I am convinced that one cannot take part in the new Mass and even just to be present, one must have a serious reason. We cannot collaborate in spreading a right which, even if it is not heretical, leads to heresy. This is the rule I am giving my friends, Bishop de Castro Mayer. Bishop Tissier. This is great. And this is, this is 2016. This is 2016. So I'm surprised they didn't execute him after this. Clearly, says Bishop Tissier, we cannot accept this faked new right of ordination that leaves doubts concerning the validity of numerous ordinations done according to the new right. Thus, the new right of ordination is not Catholic. And so we will, of course, faithfully continue to transmit the real and valid priesthood by the traditional priestly right of ordination. Powerful. And then uh, numerous quotes from even Father Peter Scott. He says here, um, our Father Scott, for regardless, Peter Scott, regardless of the technical question of the validity of a priest's holy orders, we all recognize the Catholic sense that tells us there can, there can be no mixing of the illegitimate new rites with the traditional Catholic rites, a principle so simply elucidated by Archbishop Lefebvre on June 29, 1976, when Archbishop Lefebvre said, quote, We are not of this religion. We do not accept this new religion. We are of the religion of, the, of all time of the Catholic religion. We are not of that universal religion as they call it today. It is no longer the Catholic religion. We are not of that liberal modernist religion that has its own worship, priests, faith, catechisms, its own Bible. That's Father Scott in 2007. And then um, I'll give you this quote from the Dominicans of Avrier on the question of the new rites of ordinations and consecrations. Due to the generalized disorder, both at the liturgical and dogmatic levels, we can have serious reasons to doubt the validity of certain Episcopal ordinations. And that's why Archbishop Lefebvre conditionally reordained these priests coming from the Novus Ordo. That's why I insist priests like Father Poisson, who's a very good-hearted man and very zealous priest, I hope, he should be conditionally reordained. And Archbishop Lefebvre would. It's, it's not a big deal. Just do it. Uh, Archbishop Lefebvre on Freemasonry in the church. I quoted some already from you. Um, <clears throat> regarding this, the influence comes from Protestantism and from Freemasonry. One must say it. These are Masonic ideas that the church must not claim to be the only way of salvation. If the church wants to be a friend with Protestants and Freemasons, she must give up saying that she is the only way of salvation. She must accept 
to say that all religions are ways of salvation, says Archbishop Lefebvre. But this is contrary to what our Lord Jesus Christ himself said. Our Lord said, Go, teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. He who shall believe shall be saved. He who shall not believe shall be condemned. There is no other choice. Archbishop Lefebvre, 1986. Archbishop Lefebvre on ecumenism. 1978, April. Ecumenism is not the church's mission. The church is not ecumenical. She is missionary. That is, she goes out to convert, not to dialogue. The goal of the missionary church is to convert. The goal of the ecumenical church is to find what is true in errors and to remain at this level. It is to deny, to deny the truth of the church. So, more quotes on the satanic ecumenism. He calls it satanic. Archbishop Lefebvre on obedience, because this is something that's very, been very heavily promoted on the society priests since 2012. The, the, the retreats, the, um, the priests' meetings every year, they're pounding over and over again obedience. A way they did, they never did when we were in the seminary in our early priesthood. Archbishop Lefebvre, 74. Satan has really succeeded in pulling off a master stroke. He is, he is succeeding in having those who kept the Catholic faith condemned by the very people who should be defending and propagating it. Satan reigns through ambiguity and incoherence, which are his means of combat and which deceive men of little faith. Satan's master stroke by which he is bringing about the auto-destruction of the church, is to use obedience in order to destroy the faith, authority against truth. How could we, by blind and servile obedience, obedience go along with these schismatics, who ask us to collaborate in their enterprise of demolishing the church? 1976. So in other words, we don't obey these, these Vatican II orders. Archbishop Lefebvre against sedevicantism. Because sedevicantism is very popular now. And a lot of resistance priests are falling into it. Many faithful are falling into it. And Pope Francis is the greatest propagator of sedevicantism. Because he's such a scandal. But Archbishop Lefebvre dealt with worse, worse popes. Paul VI was worse. John Paul II, in a way, was worse. So here's what he says. When Pope Honorius was condemned, he was condemned as a pope. This is Archbishop Lefebvre, 1984, Conference on Sedevicantism and Liberalism in a Cone. When Pope Honorius was condemned, he was condemned as pope. And yet the Council of Constantinople, I believe it was Pope Leo II, although I'm not sure, condemned Pope Honorius for favoring heresy. He didn't say he favored heresy, so he is no longer the Pope. No, and neither did he say, since he was the Pope, you had to obey him and accept what he said. No, because he condemned him. So what did Catholics have to do then? Well, one had to admit that Pope Honorius was the Pope, but one did not have to follow him because he favored heresy. Isn't that the conclusion then? That seems to me the normal conclusion. Well, we are in the same situation. One day these popes will be condemned by their successors. One day the truth will return. And that's where we stand. To keep their attachment to Rome, the faithful, to keep attachment to, to Rome and to remain faithful to the apostolicity, to the visibility of the church, which are essential things, and if they, even if they do not follow the popes when they favor heresy, as Pope Honorius did. He's been convinced. Those who would have followed Pope Honorius at that time would have been mistaken since he was condemned afterwards. So then I believe that we would be misled in actually following the popes in what they are doing. But they will probably also one day be condemned by the ecclesiastical authority. John the twenty third. Paul VI, John Paul II will be desainted because they're not really saints, 
and they'll all be condemned, says Archbishop Lefebvre, most likely someday. Archbishop Lefebvre is asked in 1986. This is an interview in 1989 regarding the 1986 Assisi meeting. And someone says to Archbishop Lefebvre, it seems you are implicitly a sede vacantis. Archbishop Lefebvre, no, it's not because I say that the Pope is unfaithful to his task that I say there isn't a Pope anymore or that I say he is a formal heretic. I think that it is necessary to judge the men of current Rome and those who are under their influence the same way the bishops, Pope Pius IX and St. Pius X considered liberals and modernists. Question, how did they consider them? Answer, Pope Pius IX condemned liberal Catholics. He even said this terrible sentence, quote, liberal Catholics are the worst enemies of the church. What more could he say? However, he did not say all liberal Catholics are excommunicated, are outside the church, and must be denied communion. No, he considered these men as the worst enemies of the church, and yet he did not excommunicate them. The Holy Pope Pius X in his encyclical Pascendi also dealt as severe on a judgment on modernism, calling it the synthesis of all heresies. I do not know if it is possible to bring a more severe judgment to condemn a movement. But he did not say that all modernists would now, from now on, be excommunicated or outside the church and that they had to be refused communion. He condemned some of them. Also, I think that like these two popes, we must judge them severely, but not necessarily considering them as being outside the church. That is why I do not want to follow the set of Ecantists, who say these popes are modernists, modernism is the crossroads of heresies, so modernists are heretics, so they are no longer in communion with the church, so there isn't a pope anymore. We cannot make a judgment with such implacable logic. There is, in this way of judging, passion and a little pride. Let us, ju let us judge these men and their errors in the same way as the popes themselves did. The pope is modernist, that's certain, like Cardinal Ratzinger and many men of his entourage. But let us judge them like Pope Pius IX and St. Pius X judge them. And so this is why we continue to pray for the pope and to ask God to give him the graces he needs to accomplish his task. So what is our attitude? It is clear that all those who are leaving us or who have left us for sedificantism or because they want to be submitted to the present hierarchy of the church, all the while hoping to keep tradition, we cannot have relations with them anymore. It is not possible. We must be free from compromise as much with regard to sedificantis as regard to those who absolutely want to be submitted to the ecclesiastical authority. That's pretty, there's a lot of wisdom in these words. Don't go to the right with set of econtism. Don't go to the left with false compromise. Hold the ground. That's hard to do. I know this is getting long, but let's uh, just wrap up a few more quotes on this. 1989, Archbishop Lefebvre, Fidelitur, number 68, March. Unlike the set of Icantus, we act vis-a-vis -vis the Pope as vis-a-vis -vis the successor of Peter. We address ourselves to him as such, and we pray as such. The majority of faithful and traditional priests also feel that it is the prudential and wise solution to recognize that there is a successor on the throne of Peter and that it is necessary to strongly oppose him because of the errors he spreads. The solution of sedificantism is not a solution, says Archbishop Lefebvre, 19, 1989. The solu it poses a lot of problems because if since Pope Paul VI there were no popes, then all the cardinals that were made by these popes are invalidly made. So the votes they made as cardinals, members of the conclave, are void. And who will then establish the link with John the Twenty-Third? And even if we think that John XXIII wasn't Pope either, then we have to go back to Pius XII. Who is going to reestablish the tie? Because if these cardinals were invalidly made cardinals, they cannot elect the future Pope. 
Who is going to designate the next, the new pope? We are completely lost. It is not surprising that in these circles there have been groups that have been made a pope. It is logical. Let us keep a little the solution of common sense and the solution that the faithful inspire in us. Da 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 da. The faithful have the sense of the faith. They have a good sense in the sense of the faith. We cannot. We can rely on the judgment of our good Christians, our good faithful. All right. So a lot more about sedificantism, but the Archbishop never fell into it. Although he did toy the possibility, but he never fell into it. Sometimes we believe that they are traditional and that they conform to the truth of the church and then all of a sudden they fall into error and lead people into error. It is very, very dangerous. They scandalize and lead millions of faithful into error. Um, Archbishop Lefebvre on the 1984 Oath of Fidelity basically condemns it. Archbishop Lefebvre on the New Code of Canon Law Conference in Long Island, 1983. And in fact, there is even an additional obstacle, which is the new code of canon law. That's when it came out, which has been made in the same spirit. I've, I've just been speaking to you about the spirit of the council, a bad spirit. Conference in Germany, 1984. Another grave problem now undermining the church is found in the new code of canon law. The new code... The new canon law is very serious, for it goes much further than the council itself. The new code can be conceived as a great effort to transfer into canonical language this doctrine itself, namely conciliar ecclesiology. So he saw the new code as putting into practice the, the Vatican II. <coughs> Archbishop Lefebvre on papal infallibility. I'll just close with this interview in 1989. For the Second Vatican Council, Pope Paul VI did not use the principle of dogmatic infallibility. He was satisfied with declaring it a pastoral council. The conciliar popes are unable to use their doctrinal infallibility because the very foundation of infallibility is to believe that a truth must be fixed forever, and can no longer change. It must remain as it is. John Paul II, even more than Paul VI, does not believe in the immutability of truth. So that's interesting. He says this because the modernists don't believe in established truth. So they don't believe in infallibility. So they don't use their infallibility. So these popes of the Vatican II have never used their infallibility on the council or on anything. So they have a right to our disobedience. So there's a little bit of insight on some of the quotes of Archbishop Lefebvre. As you see, we could go on forever. But he said enough to be our guide. Don't go to Sedevicantism. Don't seek a false union with Rome until Rome comes back to tradition. So we're left us scattered sheep throughout the world to just hold on with the light of these wise counsels and direction and fight on until Our Lady steps in. So I'll close with that and I'll um, shut the off button and we'll close with that. God bless you all here in Australia. <laughs>